All I said to him was, I'll give you 50 quid for the lot. And he just took his records and walked out of the shop. After I spent half an hour looking at Sergeant Pepper's ass, Filthy too. Ring wear, edge wear, spindle wear. <laughs> that was definitely a pube in a white album as well. Not so many in since lockdown finished. They've all got used to buying off of eBay. I don't mind coming, people coming into the shop and saying, that's scratched. You said it was VG plus. It's not VG plus, it's VG minus. Can you do me a deal? I don't mind. I honestly don't mind if it's in the shop when they're standing in front of you. But when they're in Moscow, it's a royal pain in the arse. And all the marching to and from the post office. I mean, how many copies of Rumours and Purple Rain do people need? How many times can one man listen to Graceland for surface noise? No, you can't fucking call me out. <laughs> Come on, Enid. Christine said to me this morning that I do actually do that. Listen to every record that I buy. <laughs> I only listen to the good stuff, I say. Dave, she says, you listen to everything. What were you listening to last night? It was terrible. <laughs> Since when did you get so opinionated, I say? You're the bloody Thompson Twins fan. <laughs> that shut her up. She used to love the Thompson Twins. I bought her the first album when we were at uni. Still got it somewhere up in the loft. She got into them like everybody else, because of the hits. We are detective. Unlistenable bollocks. Everyone bought it then. No one wants it now. They've joined the four horsemen of the vinyl apocalypse. Mantovani, Max Bygraves, James Last and Leo Sayer. <laughs> the Thompson Twins. Even in the 80s they had the smell of the charity shop about them. A quick step and a sidekick. It's in every collection I see. No parlay, no jacket required, no fucking thanks. She's not one for being silent long though, Christine. Soon got back to being right about everything. I mean, I'm glad I married a musician, don't get me wrong. I'm happy she loves music. Does it have to be such shit music? She says to me, I don't think that music you were playing last night would have made the band much money. I know exactly what music I was playing last night and I think, I'm gonna win this one. So I put down my Marmite on toast and I say, oh yeah, Chris. What music was that then? I don't know, she says. Sounded like a mad tramp singing over some children playing drums. That, I say, was Captain Beefheart. Trout Mask Replica, an acknowledged classic. First press copy on straight as well. 100 quid record. Waste of money, she says. How many hits did Captain Beefhead have? It's all about the hits with Christine. She had one, you see. Hit of her own. Beautiful voice, my wife. Terrible band, though. It was the 80s, so not much good stuff came out of that decade. Yeah, all right. Prince, Madness, The Cure, and later on The Smiths and The Stone Roses. But other than that, Simon Le Bon's foot stamping on a human face forever. After uni, Christine and I moved to London. Terrible time to live in a bedsit, the 80s. Padded shoulders, back-combed hair. Still, credit to her, she kept the band going. They played everywhere and eventually got a record deal. It took about five minutes before Radio 1 playlisted the record. Beefheart really isn't about hits, I say. 
Well, you can say that again, she says. Did he ever think about getting any adults in the band? Or maybe even writing a tune? Oh. He had loads of tunes, I say. But then I had a brain freeze. I couldn't think of any beef art tunes. I had the one about the mascara snake going on in my head. Eventually, while she isn't looking, I go on my phone. But by the time I find, I love you, you big dummy, she's gone to work. Of course, she was always going to win that debate because, you see, she did have a hit. Straight in at number 16, it's Eastern Star with Rhythm in My Heart. I think it went top ten in Germany, Austria, France. It may even have been number one in Switzerland for a split second. Occasionally, Christine gets stopped in the street or at a party. She's very generous, always got the time of day. Funny thing about hit singles, everyone's got their own special memories. Let's face it, your favourite song is probably a bit rubbish, but if you first heard it that day in maths when the girl smiled at you or that morning on the bus when that boy gave you his seat, well, you know. <laughs> It was on the radio all the time. I'd hear it on the way to work, in shops. Christine was on tour, supporting the Eastern Star album, also called Rhythm In My Heart. The record company got them playing all over Europe. Well, miming all over Europe, supporting the hit on the TV. I didn't see her for ages. Just the band and Gordon, the manager, Schlepping around for weeks. She told me on the phone. Inevitable, really, when you're on tour with the same people every day. What else are you going to do? You get up, you get on the tour bus, you play cards and watch films all day. You get off the tour bus, you do the sound check, you sit around and wait, you play the gig, you go to the bar, you get drunk, you go to bed. Repeat that every day, and who isn't going to turn down a shag with a drummer? Jeremy Clarkson. He didn't even have his own name. No amount of getting people to call you Jez is going to change that. Back then, Clarkson was only just on the telly, so he hadn't realised the true horror of what was awaiting us, but, you know, you wouldn't really want his name even back then. Bloody drummers. I wouldn't have minded so much if it had been the guitarist. <sighs> hello, Spindleware. Oh, hello, love. Hey. Oh, yeah, two missed calls. No, sorry, I was miles away. Yeah? Yeah, sure, I can drop him off some stuff on the way, on, uh, on the way back. No, the traffic, the traffic's all right before four. All right, love. OK. Yeah. Love you. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Paul's been trying to reach me. Looks like he's out of toilet roll again and I've got to bring him some. Not how I envisage my future, wiping my 30-year-old son's ass. That's not fair. He's in the high-risk category, so he's not going out. Mind you, he's never been life's most active man. Rarely leaves the flat at the best of times, so a pandemic was the dream ticket. I'll get him some Andrex and ready meals on the way home. When Christine came back from tour, I was ready to forgive her. Start again, a tearful reunion. 
No such luck. She told me she was in love. With Jeremy Clarkson, I said. His name is Jez, she said. In love. I don't get that. In pop songs, maybe, but in real life? With a drummer? Shit drummer, too. No feel. They lasted a good while, though. Longer than the band. They had a couple of flops and got dropped. Christine got the solo deal. I should have a section in the shop for unwanted solo albums. Mick Jagger, Roger Daltrey, bloke out of Kasabian. Any takers? No? Christine's was pretty good though. I have happy memories of those songs. Mainly because halfway through making the album, her and Jeremy Clarkson split up. She got a session drummer in the band, so Clarkson got the hump. <laughs> she came back. I still had all her stuff. I'd kept it in the spare room along with all the vinyl. I think even back then I was thinking of doing the shop. So she finished making a record. It came out and it's humble. No one bought it. To be honest, I don't think anyone could have bought it even if they'd wanted to. Record company can't have pressed up more than 100 copies. Gordon, the manager, tried to get them to release a single, but by then the A&R man had left and the record company were more interested in, I don't know, Hot House Flowers, Sinead O'Connor, Proclaimers, Love and Money. It was all about Celtic rock in those days. Actually, if you're interested in that sort of stuff, I've got a four for ten deal at the moment. So Christine got dropped. And then got ready to drop. See what I did there? Pregnant. Silver linings and all that. And Paul, my lovely lazy son, was born at the start of the 90s. Just in time for grunge and acid house. I was earning enough at the council for the three of us, so Christine didn't have to work. And then she got a job with Gordon, the ex-manager. He was looking after a couple of new acts after Eastern Star got dropped. She told me when Paul was about five, I wasn't his dad. To be honest, by then I didn't care. I was enjoying being a dad so much. So what if he wasn't mine? At least he wasn't Jeremy Clarkson's. Imagine if he'd been his dad. No. It was the manager. Gordon. Very hands-on management. We can joke about it now. I was a bit miffed at the time. We got over it though. He came to our wedding, gave us a jukebox as a wedding present. Actually, Gordon is a really nice guy. And he's doing seriously well at the moment. I'm not going to mention who he manages. Suffice to say, they're doing way better than Eastern Star ever did. Shifting used copies of their records is not a problem. I just wish he'd come and see his son a bit more. But he is very busy. Christine stopped seeing him just before we got married. I forgave her. She's very forgivable. And I'm pretty forgiving. I'm very forgiving, actually. What's the point in not being forgiving? Forgive, forget, move on. All the good stuff. Oh, for fuck's sake, look at the state of this. The owner's written his name all over the label. Flowers raining 
petal drops from above Peace comes to shine An opening locket Your beautiful smile 